and the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you here. Today is the feast, we celebrate the feast of the Holy Transfiguration of the Lord, and where he went up the mountain with Peter and James and John, and was suddenly a shining beam of light. Shining. Another kind of worldly light. Some different kind of light. Some different kind of existence. Something outside of, the, of their experience. They had never seen or even dreamed of anything being like this before. Here he was, along with Moses and Elijah, transformed beings of light, having a conversation. This, of course, was completely foreign to their experience. Didn't know what to make of it. Couldn't figure out what to make of this drama before them on the mountain. I've been to the top of that mountain myself. I've been there. It's an ordinary place. But you can see how. And you could see where someone could figure out that heaven could meet heaven, that heaven and earth could meet in that very holy place. And that something otherworldly could happen there. And so we we're always, as you know, talking about both worlds. This world and the other world. Christianity is filled with us uh, experiencing the fruits of the the other world. We access this first by baptism, where we are baptized into the book of the living, which is the other world, the new Jerusalem. We are we rise in a new creation in Christ, crafted into Christ, so that we too are glorified in this existence in the other world. And Jesus talks about this other world continuously. He says the kingdom of God is at hand. He talks about this all the time. The kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed that blossoms into a great tree. All the birds of the air come to visit. The kingdom of God is like the leaven that goes into the dry flower. And suddenly the whole batch is leavened. This is a process of unfolding to us that which has been from the beginning. This is the access point for us as Christians to have access to the other world. When we are talking about why would we rather be in the other world? Well, because we are passing through this world from, from birth to experience to growth to death to new life. And we have experienced this as a torment, as a test, as a uh, coming of age, as a growing up, as experiential, experiencing those things which we know as grief and anger and hatred and persecution and humility and the compassion and rising above into these things into the higher elements of goodness and, and, and kindness and purity of heart. And we approach these things. And as we have faith in Him, we are transformed ourselves. The transformation is from within, and you can say, well, we become this light beings. We can become these light beings. And so that they are suddenly there and suddenly not there. And when we leave our bodies, as like St. Peter says, we're going to put our tents aside. We're going to go into a glorious existence, which we have already seen, what awaits us? They are our witnesses. Jewish law requires that in order to convict anyone to actually be relieved, you must have the eyewitness testimony of not one, not two, but three witnesses. That is why Jesus took James, John, and Peter with him up the mountain. have three witnesses. And so that their testimony is true that what they have seen, so do not believe. These are these 
things which come down to us. It all makes sense when we think about what is the purpose of this transfiguration. Why did Jesus take them out there to have this conversation, this meeting, with these uh, Moses and Elijah who had come before? Why Moses and Elijah? Why not Abraham and Isaac? And Isaac? Why not Jacob? Why not anybody else? Any of the other prophets? What, what about Jeremiah? Why not? Well, because Moses represents the law. Through Moses came the law. And the, and the covenant. I will be God, be my people, keep the law. Here's the law. Here's the commands. Here's the tell. We accept this, O oh God, and be it done to us. If we keep this law, we will be blessed into the end generation. If we, if we disobey this law, then we will be cursed until the tenth generation. And these were said that Moses represents the law. And Elijah represents the prophets. And so the, the Jewish faith was based upon the law and the prophets and the faith in the one God. And so here they in the belief in the coming of the Messiah, who was prophesied by Moses, prophesied by Elijah and all the prophets. So here is Jesus as the fulfillment in himself of the law and the prophets. That's why we have him with Moses and Elijah. And so he himself is the fulfillment. Now when the voice comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved son, this is the confirmation that was given to John the Baptist, who we now know Jesus has described that, that, that Elijah had already come. There was a saying and a belief that Elijah must come before the, to the, the Messiah. So when John the Baptist was now proclaimed as being the reincarnated uh, John Elijah, that is therefore is there for, in order to announced that the coming of the Lord is upon us, and here he is. And the same revelation that was made to John the Baptist in the river, this is my beloved son, listen to him, the same revelation is made to these three witnesses on top of the mountain transfiguration. This is my beloved son. This was not made to John the Baptist individually, but to three witnesses who can now tell us with credibility that we can believe it. have a basis of a fulfillment. The entire Old Testament, uh, the, the Genesis, the laws, the judges, the prophets, the law, this was a preparation for the coming of the Messiah. What do you mean? What I mean is Adam fell from sin, that's Genesis chapter 1. Adam fell from grace, and from that sin entered into the world, and from that moment on, the Messiah was prophesied that he would come and correct that sin, to atone for that sin, to undo that sin of the original fall of man. And the reason he did this was because he loved him. And loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world to save sinners. The ruling on chief. This is done, the method that Jesus lays out for us for undoing this sin is faith in him. Before that, it was obedience to the law. If you have a covenant, you say, I will do this deal, this is my covenant with you, here's my terms, your terms, we agree on this, and we seal it in blood. It's a contract, a covenant that was made between God and man, the Jews. And we know because they broke the covenant so many times, and sent to exile, and the temple fall, and they were cast out from their land, it was given to them, and they came back. Second chance, you know, the second chance. 
And so the all prophets that were uh, that were sent by God were slain. They killed them. The powers that be turned on them and killed them for invoking the prophecies of God. They were killed. All of them. seems as if this is the path for us. Is that Jesus says, I'll give you an easier path, but it's not that much easier. If you believe in me, your pathway is to salvation, that you, the sin of Adam is undone in you, that is, you can now enter into the kingdom of paradise through this faith. And now, just because faith Faith engenders God-like uh, personalities. That you will care for others. That you will feed the hungry. That you will clothe them. That you will shut the doors to all of us. That you will undo the deeds of unrighteousness. And that you will do the best that you can in order to be God, Christ in the midst of your fellow neighbors. And the most and foremost for good of their sin. Jesus says, healing and forgiveness are the same thing, which is easier to say, stand up and walk, your sins are forgiven. Healing and forgiveness are the same thing. Abundance, there is no lack. The only lack is in our perception because we have no faith. We believe it, we can create all the food to me. Jesus says, I will feed the hungry because I can manifest it. In my, and he says, anything you ask in my name, baskets of fish, Baskets of loaves, whatever you need will be provided to you if you would ask me in my name and you believe it. So the power of faith is the power that access, we have access to the other world to supply our needs in this world. The other world, the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ brings about in us a surety, an eyewitness testimony that what awaits us is beyond our senses and beyond our experience in this dimensional realm. But there is another dimensional realm, we call it the kingdom of God, called it the New Jerusalem, we call it, whatever you want to call it, multi-phasic you know, harmonics of dimensional realities. It is has, it's filled with sentient beings. Sentient beings, the angels, archangels, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, celestial virtues, many high cherubim, six million seraphim, and all these otherworldly creatures, beings, fabulous beings, the ancient of days, the watchers, and those are the ones who mean us goodness. And it's the other side, the demonic forces which mean destruction, hatred, avarice, ambition, war, anger, destruction, death. And to every life, the choices are made. You choose the way of right, light, peace and goodness and life, or you choose the way of anger and death and destruction. You make these choices. And he says to us that there's really no medium choice. You can't choose, you can't be on the fence and choose both good and bad. You have to be committed. You need to choose a side. And if you can't choose a side now, or you will be forced in some point to choose a side. You can choose the way of faith, which unlocks the the world of abundance and grace and mercy and love and goodness and joy. Well, if you're not talk about joy, heaven and the other world is joyful. I mean, the most. Can you imagine joyfulness? 
the, uh, one of the happiest things I ever saw was we had a little girl who came here uh, many years ago, and she was uh, wanted to learn how to cook, so we gave her some cooking lessons, along with a bunch of other kids. But because she had excelled and worked so hard and she wanted to cook, she wanted to be a chef. She said, I want to be a chef. She was like 10 years old. The restaurant, the cookers, uh, store down here, gave us a cooker set for her. And she took her mother to work. So I took her down there with her pots and pans, and that little girl got out of that car with those pots and pans, and it was like she floated across the car. She was so happy, such joy. I don't think her feet touched the ground. It was just, she was a float from the car to the door as she was just. Everything that was horrible, bad in her life, and it was a lot of evaporated. There's the other part of this uh, equation. 
and that when Jesus was, the event was over, and the cloud was gone, the voice was gone, the Moses was gone, the light was gone, and there was Jesus standing there in front of them. They had to come back down the mountain. And when they came back down the mountain, the other apostles were there, saying, trying to cast out a demon and going through all this chaos. They couldn't cast it out. They said it was too hard. The man was rolling around in the fire, calling everybody a bunch of names, acting stupid, acting ridiculous, acting out of his mind, and he was. And they complained to Jesus, we can't cast it out. Help us. And Jesus exasperatedly said, how, must, how long must I endure this faithless generation? And then he cast out the demon. The discussion with Peter, James, and John on the way down from the mountain had to do with what was going to happen next. They're going to tell no one about what you have just seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Risen from the dead. You can't rise from the dead without being dead first. Die to this existence first. You can't rise from the dead until you are dead. <coughs> St. Peter is talking about the manner in which he would meet this death. He said, told me to be crucified. Paul would be beheaded. James would be run through with the soul. But how you would be skinned alive. Thomas would be run through with arrows. Philip would be burned with the stake. Stephen would be stoned. And many others would be fed to the lions. On fire. There is a right of passage. So that the faith that we proclaim, we say we need, we say we have access, we say we want, we say we understand, but there is a testing that comes that separates the gold from the dross. In order to get separated out gold or silver from the rock that's to be captured in it, it has to be burned and separated the dross. There is a there is a energy which goes into it, which is a destructive energy. Any woman who has had a baby understands this process of pain in order to get something good. Why I said it like that, I don't know. But it seems to be that that is the system by which we are propelled out of our bodies. I, don't, I suspect several of you have been at that side when someone has lost this, passed away. I've been in this situation very many times. And there's always an energy transfer. I always feel it, I always sense it, and I'm always aware of it. And most of the time, when a soul departs from a body, it is very, very joyful. And, ah, I didn't know. It's like this peace. Most of the time. And there are 
both times. Uh, this abject terror. It happens, it's real. We're given choices in our life. Sometimes we're in the same moment, the same hour, the same day, the same situation. You can choose the good or the bad, the or evil from the good, the hard from the from the easy. You can choose the difficult. The easy way. And so by making these choices, the sums of our choices are what we experience as a, a, a conscious record of our existence. Jesus has told us that the end that awaits us is where we are gathered at the wilderness of Babylon after we have died. Our souls are there with him and he will separate us the, like the sheep and the goats. And those on his left will go to the kingdom, and those on his right will go to Daniel. And what is the criteria by which he makes this judgment? I was hungry and you did anything. I was naked and you clothed me. I was lost and you gave me direction. What you've done for the least of these, you have done for me. What you've not done for the least of these, you have not done for me either. And by your own acts, you have judged yourself. And so this transfigured existence is in a waiting, is a waiting for us, and you can have the way of life and light or darkness and death. But it's based upon this realm that carry forth into the next. And he says. Well, is it like that? Does it just have to be the sum of all my bads and all my goods? And he says, no, it doesn't. He says that love casts out many sins. If you can love your way, you can undo a lot of sins. If you can forgive, the sins of others, your sins are also forgiven. If you can't forgive them, then your sins are bound. If you can't let go, those who have hurt you, persecuted, and, and, and denied you, abandoned you, if you can't do that, then I'm sorry, you condemn yourself. But if you can, all those other sins are wiped away. And you stand before him at the front of the line, ready to go. Filled with faith, filled with life, filled with grace, filled with all these compassions and, and all these 